Alright everybody, welcome back to another video. Have you ever gone through the summer and brewed up Pilsner, IPA, other typical summer beers like that and reached the end of the summer and have been wondering what still has those summer beer drinking qualities that can also last me into the fall and has a little bit more body maybe or something more exciting for my taste buds to experience while still feeling light and airy uh, like a summer beer? Well, I think the answer to that question is a Belgian whip beer. So watch on as I show you how to make one of those just in time for the end of the summer. Hey, so if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome to you. This channel is all about making grain glass videos where I take a beer, I make the recipe, I brew the beer, and then I taste the beer all in the same video. So you get to see what happened and what critical process points were met or were not met and how that affected uh, each part of the final beer. I hope you enjoy that type of thing. Uh, I'm really excited to make this one. It's been a long time since I've made a true wit beer. Uh, so this should be fun. All right, so whipped beer basically translates to white beer. Uh, it's also known as a beer blanche in French-speaking parts of the world. Uh, and it's actually one of the world's oldest types of beer. And nearly every example of a whipped beer has some sort of spice addition to it. So the idea of adding spices to this beer actually harkens back to the way before hops were even known or cultivated for brewing. Um, and spices were used. Spices and herbs typically were used to balance out the malty sweetness of a beer. And as most beers in that part of the world kind of trace their lineage back to monks, it's no different with the whip beer. It was a monastic type of beer that was brewed in primarily Belgium and the northern German area. The whip beer is a really pleasant beer to drink because it is just a wonderful combination of mouthfeel, delicate, airy flavors, and just a, a very pleasant uh, drinking experience, all without being too boozy or strong. Uh, so you have a beer that's pretty full-bodied and is exciting, but also full-flavored and not too heavy. It's also supposed to be very pale, you know, hence wit being white. Uh, so typically you're going to see these beers brewed with about a 50-50 mix of malted barley and unmalted or flaked wheat, typically is what we'll see. Uh, however, I'm electing to add a little bit of flaked oats in there as well, because that's going to increase the amount of creaminess and really silkiness uh, that you would perceive in the mouthfeel, and I think that's absolutely critical for this beer style. Uh, really the critical thing in this is a high protein malt bill. Uh, that's going to give you that fullness of flavor and fullness of mouthfeel as well. And of course, with that high protein malt bill, you really do want to have some sort of rice hull uh, percentage of your grain bill in there. I would suggest about a pound's worth for a five gallon batch um, so that you don't end up with a stuck mash and issues when you're watering. So I'm sure 90% of people out there have had this beer style before. It is pretty popular. I really don't like Blue Moon very much, but it does claim to be a Belgian white, which is a wit beer. Uh, but I would point you towards Hogarden Blanche or Allagash White or Alaskan White, uh, if you want a really good example on the American side of what a wit beer really should be. So that is kind of what we're gonna try to mimic here. So I'm really hoping this ends up being a pretty nice beer. Uh, but anyway, this is gonna be our recipe. So we have six and a half pounds of Belgian Pilsner malt. I think that's very important, having continental Pilsner. Uh, six and a half pounds of flaked wheat, and that's gonna add, you know, that other half of the grain bill, high protein, and then three quarters of a pound of flaked oats, and that is primarily gonna be there to contribute heavily to mouthfeel, and uh, you know, obviously continue to up the protein content. We're also adding a pound of rice hulls in there to aid with uh, laudering because of all of that protein. Um, so for hops, relatively simple. This is a beer that you don't want to be overly bitter, uh, and you know, it's very delicate. So I am adding one ounce of Tetanang at 60 minutes, and that is it, just for 13 IBUs. So for yeast, the consensus is that it's really kind of hard to find a good substitute for this. Uh, so there really is only one highly encouraged option, and that is why yeast 3944 Whitbeer yeast. Uh, we're using one smack pack of that, so we're using just the smack pack here. I'm not actually making a starter because I kind of want to stress the yeast out a little bit. I want to get them to express more of their character, uh, and that is a very critical part of this beer's uh, flavor profile as well. All right, and now for one of the signature parts of the beer, and that is spices. Um, so we're going to add all of our spices at five minutes, and typically you're going to see things like coriander and orange peel in here. I'm, I'm adding both of those, but I'm also adding a tiny, tiny bit of cardamom. Uh, and that is just out of pure curiosity. So I've never used cardamom before in a beer, but I've heard it's quite powerful and quite potent, but it can have a really nice flavor, I think, if used, I think, if used properly. So I'm gonna add just a tiny, tiny bit of that. We're adding 10 grams of coriander seed, and I'm going to use whole coriander seed and crush that up before adding it in. We're gonna use an ounce and a half of 
fresh orange peel. I have an orange or two in my fridge right now and we are just gonna zest that thing until we get about an ounce and a half of uh, orange peel. And I found through previous experience that fresh orange peel not only is more potent than dried orange peels, but also gives a more classic orange flavor. Uh, I think it tastes way, way better than the dried stuff. Um, and also then we're gonna add three grams of cardamom pods. I'm using green cardamom. Uh, and hopefully that has a positive effect. We will find out. Uh, for water, uh, you're going to want to use somewhat of a balanced profile. So this is what I have. My, my water is relatively minerally to start with. So I don't really use reverse osmosis or distilled water. Uh, I do try to use my city's water as much as I can. Um, and so you'll notice that my water profile is rather minerally. Uh, I don't think that's really necessary for most people. Um, but this is just in here as a guide so you can see what effects my water profile has on the beer. So my water profile is going to be 54 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 105 parts per million of sulfate, 123 parts per million of chloride, and 36 parts per million of bicarbonate. And I am adding six grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, and two grams of calcium chloride to my water to uh, achieve that profile. And that's for both the mash and a sparge water. Now, if you don't live in my town, you're probably gonna have a different water profile, but that's just kind of a guide for a balanced water profile, which you can emulate, but I don't really suggest you copy it part, you know, to the exact parts per million. Now, when it comes to the mash, there's a couple ways you can do this. Um, some methods call for a protein rest at um, 122 degrees for about 20 minutes, or you can do an extended single infusion rest, which is what I am doing. I have enough protein in there already to give me a very strong head retention um, and I think it's going to do a good job of ensuring that uh, we have the mouthfeel that we need at the standard mash rest temperature. So I'm just going to do a single infusion mash at 150 Fahrenheit but I'm going to extend that mash and hold it for 90 minutes just to be damn sure that I have all of the conversion that I need. Um, but anyway, my water is up to the mash temperature now. I've separated out the sparge and mash water. Both of them have been treated with the proper water profile and a Camden tablet so that I get rid of the chlorine and chloramine uh, contaminants in my water that can ruin a beer's flavor. So we will go ahead, move over there and dough in. Okay, so we're about ready to dough in now. Um, so it's gonna be a rather thick mash, like I said, so with all that wheat and oats and stuff, so it's definitely a good idea to add those rice hulls. I've gone ahead and distributed those throughout my grain bill. So this is just a little recirculation system that I built for myself about a year ago. Um, I've used it in most of my beers. It's really not necessary to make a good beer. Uh, it does help with mash temperature consistency for the most part, but uh, it's really not a big deal. If you don't have this, you'll be fine if you make uh, beer in an igloo cooler or brew in a bag style. Both of those types of things will work fine for brewing this beer. Okay, so I've now completed my mash. Um, it's been 90 minutes. Everything looks like it went pretty well. Uh, so now comes the kind of tricky part where we figure out how to lauder this thing uh, without, hopefully, without getting stuck mash. So what I typically do is drain the wort from this mash tun here into this kettle here. Total capacity of this kettle is about eight gallons. So uh, between the first runnings and then a sparge and the second runnings, hopefully I get up to the top of this kettle at eight gallons and then uh, we transition uh, this mash tun into the boil kettle. So take the bag out, take the false bottom out, all that stuff. Um, and then we transfer back in and start the boil. Uh, hopefully that goes off without too many issues. Uh, given the high protein malt bill, I'm a bit worried, but I think we'll be all right overall. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna show that part on camera for the length of the video's sake, but I will catch you when we're ready to start the boil. So for our pre-boil gravity sample, looks like it's about 10.8 bricks which translates to a very nice specific gravity of 1042 for a pre-boil. It's uh, a few points high, but that's good. It means I dialed my system back in. Okay, so it is now the top of the boil. So we're gonna add our 60 minute bittering hop addition, which is a one ounce of Tetanang. And that's it. So uh, we'll come back 
about five minutes from the end of the boil and we'll add all of our spices and yeast nutrient and stuff like that. So I'll catch you then. So we've now reached about our 10 minute mark. And uh, at that point in time, it's usually a pretty good idea to start recirculating boiling wort through your chilling system, whatever that is that you use. Uh, I typically use a plate chiller, but you might have an immersion chiller, a counterflow chiller, something like that. Um, either way, it's generally good brewing practice to sanitize the inside of that chiller using the boiling hot wort uh, and recirculating that through the chiller and back into the kettle um, over the last 10 minutes or so with the boil. Um, and what that's gonna do is just ensure the inside is sanitized. Just keep in mind, it really should be clean. Uh, if you're gonna be using this and relying upon it, really make sure you do clean out your chiller between brews. Otherwise you can develop some mold problems in your chiller and that will obviously be bad for beer. Okay, now we're down to five minutes from the end of the boil. So it's time to, first of all, add our spices. This is uh, that whole mixture of orange zest and crushed coriander seed and a few cardamom pods for fun. So let's just see how that goes when we add it in. Yeah, I did add it right in. Um, I do have a hop spider. I probably could have used that, but we'll see. <laughs> the other thing we're adding at five minutes is two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient. Generally a pretty good idea to add that in for most beers. It keeps your fermentation healthy. So we'll boil for another five minutes, then we'll immediately start chilling. Okay, so now it's the end of the boil. So we're gonna shut off all of the heat sources and start chilling now. Okay, so uh, we've got a little bit longer uh, to go in the chilling process before it's completely ready, but I figured while I'm here, I will talk to you about fermentation for this particular beer. Um, it's nothing super complicated, and one of the benefits of this type of yeast, uh, being a Belgian yeast, is that you can actually ferment it slightly hotter uh, than you typically would for a normal American or English ale yeast. Um, and that being said, it's generally not a bad idea to start the yeast out kind of cold. Um, so. Typically for a Belgian ale, I will try to follow a sort of gradual increase in the temperature over the course of the fermentation. Uh, fermentation should really take no longer than 10 to 12 days um, if you keep it at about 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. With this beer, we don't want to dry it out too much. Um, given the amount of protein that's already in it, it's not going to get very dry anyway. But ramping up the temperature over the course of the fermentation is only going to help you. So like I said, we're pitching these yeast straight out of the smack pack, um, not using any sort of starter or anything to encourage ester formation um, and to get that kind of spicy, clovey, Belgian-y character. Uh, out of it. And what we're doing here is just getting more yeast expression to keep the beer interesting. So you can make a starter for this beer and you can pitch that starter and um, you probably have a better fermentation all overall. It will be a little less sluggish, but you might get a little bit reduced ester formation. And that's really the only reason I'm doing this. Um, it's definitely not the best brewing practice to do this for every beer, but for certain beers where you want a little more, just a little bit more yeast character, um, it's okay, and considering this is going to be a relatively low original gravity beer, uh, you're really not running the risk of an unhealthy pitch. So in a nutshell, pitch just the smack pack into the beer, assuming that your OG is between 1045 and 1055, and uh, then ferment that for about 10 to 12 days, starting out at about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, ramping up slowly over the course of fermentation to about 72 at the very end. All right, so right now we are transferring the beer from the kettle into the uh, fermenter. Now, what I am doing right now is just ensuring that there's a decent amount of dissolved oxygen in there, and the way that I do that is by splashing it into the fermenter from a couple feet up. And what this, ha uh, and what this results in is several inches worth of foam on the surface of the wort uh, as it goes in, and that is just an indicator that you have enough oxygen in there for your yeast to be healthy and uh, ferment properly. Okay, so here is the original gravity. Uh, it's about 13.5 bricks, which translates to a solid 1053 for an OG on this beer. All right, so here's our final gravity sample. Uh, it looks like it's about 1010 or 1009 final gravity. I think it's 1010. Um, fermented out pretty well, so kegged it tonight and uh, we should be enjoying it pretty soon. 
All right, so we finally made our way through the fermentation. Um, it was actually really interesting fermentation. So it took a total of about 12 days, and uh, it was pretty active. Uh, produced a massive Krausen. I did need a blow-off tube for the first couple days. And what was really interesting about this one was uh, something I have not seen before, actually probably in a long time, if not ever, and that is uh, that the Krausen, once it was developed, uh, actually stayed on the beer surface fully inflated for the entirety of fermentation up until the final day where it fell back down right before I kegged it. That is something that does not happen very frequently. Typically Krausen will show up for the first two or three days, reach a high point, and then fall back down, but your beer will continue to ferment out over the next several days uh, until it reaches its final gravity. In my case, the final gravity was steady and the Krausen was still going. And uh, that was very interesting. Um, but I was, uh, I was curious and I did a little research and I found out that this is actually kind of a rather frequent occurrence when using whipped beer yeast. Um, so if that does happen to you, do not be alarmed. It's just the yeast behaving normally. So anyway, I force carbonated this keg uh, to a pretty high level. You can also bottle condition these beers and they probably will turn out a little bit better than if you keg them. Uh, but I just prefer the convenience of kegging. So anyway, let's go ahead and get to pouring this, shall we? All right, so it is called the Silk Road. Um, it comes in at 5.7% ABV and about 13 IBUs. All right, so I did actually end up topping this guy off um, just because I wanted to show you what happens when you do. <laughs> because of the incredible amount of proteins in this beer, it uh, pours with this incredible fluffy head that just is absolutely ridiculous. Holds its structure, looks like a, a cloud basically. Um, although overall appearance of the beer otherwise is very, very bright, pale, hazy color. Uh, very similar to a well-brewed New England IPA in fact in appearance, um, but very, very different in flavor. So, I mean, as you can tell, the appearance is pretty awesome. Uh, this head does stick around for a decently long amount of time, too, which is pretty awesome. Uh, it is probably a little more dark than I would have liked, though. Um, could have done with either a little bit higher amounts of uh, adjunct in the boil or, or just a shorter boil in general. Uh, probably would have been fine for this. All right, so now we'll go in for aroma. The aroma on this thing is really cool. It's like a... Uh, it's really soft, like, uh, and, and delicate and floral, very herbal floral aroma. Uh, I get a lot of like, um, like a green spice, uh, almost like a basil or an oregano, um, which is weird because like, that's not something I add to the beer, <laughs> but a really cool kind of very, very pungent, you know, strong aroma out of this thing. It's, uh, it's not holding back. Also, I hope you don't mind that I switch over to the lav mic. It is a little tiny bit breezy outside, so I don't want that to ruin the audio. Uh, we're going to go in for mouthfeel now. <sighs> mouthfeel on this is really great. Um, it's really interesting, too. So I used a ton of protein in this, you know, and, and so it has a really, really kind of chewy mouthfeel. But at the same time, it's extremely light. Uh, it is soft, pillowy, in fact. And just uh, in general, like, it, it's a very interesting intersection between having lots of substance, um, but also feeling very soft. So it's not full bodied like, uh, like a New England IPA. It doesn't really have that same level of like creamy fullness, but it's also very delicate and light and dry feeling um, like most other Belgian beers. But instead of being like spritzy and almost not even there, while it is still heavily carbonated, it has that kind of soft roundness, um, which is really cool. I, I honestly don't think any other beer that I've brewed in recent history uh, has this kind of same uh, interesting mouthfeel. It's very great. It really kind of lends to a great drinkability as well. Um, and just, it, it makes it really fascinating. I will make a note that this is uh, intended to be a rather highly carbonated style, um, and it does not have a carbonation bite. Uh, it is rather, I mean, the, the whole point of the carbonation is to make sure that you have a very lofty, pillowy, full head like you saw. Um, it produces that effect of having the, the foam overflowing in the glass, you know, and it really does actually release a lot of the aromatics as well. Um, so it's kind of an important thing for this style. Also, a nice thing I kind of want to point out is that there is a decent amount of lacing going on. Uh, like, it's actually pretty good. So that's pretty cool. Always a nice bonus. So now we're gonna go in for flavor, and boy, there's a lot to talk about here. 
<laughs> this is a great tasting beer, first of all. Like, I'm going to put that right out there right now. This is awesome. Um, there is a lot of spice in this, and it's, uh, it's a really cool combination of it. Uh, it's balanced. It's not too bitter. You know, it's a very delicate beer. Uh, there's a lot of very delicate but still complex flavors in it. And it can easily be spoiled by adding a little too much bittering hops at the beginning. Um, but because this kind of harkens back to that whole era of not having hops and just using herbs and spices to balance out your beer, I tell you, it works. Um, <laughs> this actually is a very balanced beer, but it's not necessarily bitter. And uh, I think that's really cool. So if I'm looking for hot flavor, it's not coming through and it's really honestly the way it should be. Um, you know, to be honest, malt flavor is kind of a background note as well. So this really does end up being a um, very creamy wheat type thing. Um, it has it has a, you know, kind of a nice wheat-ish note in there um, as it should, but it's, it's not the main attraction. Uh, the main attraction really is the amazing spices um, that are coming through both from the actual spices that I added and the Belgian yeast, uh, which is creating its own kind of false sense of having spices in the beer. And it's just really cool. The flavors in this are just overflowing. There's like, oh, there is a ton of citrus and it's not like a New England IPA citrus where it's juicy, orange and tropical fruit heavy. It's a very bright, soft and just brilliant note. Um, of just orange, very, very bright orange, and lemon, a little bit of lemon. At the same time, the, um, the coriander is coming through pretty strongly. I don't think I overdid it. Um, if you are a person who is sensitive to coriander, and maybe also sensitive to like black peppercorns, and you know, too much of that can kind of set you off, you may not like it, because uh, it does add a sort of zesty spiciness, not like a, a hot pepper spiciness, but just like a zest um to the beer and a general kind of a little bit of a tannic quality uh, but it is really working pretty well in this case i think it's the most prominent flavor um i think the coriander sings with the citrus in a really cool way and then the cardamom this is probably what many of you are kind of waiting to see uh how this turned out um cardamom is notorious for being a very strong spice and it can very easily uh overpower everything else in anything it's used in um it doesn't in this. In fact, if I'm searching for cardamom flavor, I think it's a background note, and I think that's probably perfect. It So cardamom, especially green cardamom, is kind of described as being a cross between citrus and pepper, which, well, that makes pretty good sense when you're using it in a beer with coriander seed and orange. So I think it does a great job of just bringing those two together, and um, it really isn't overpowering at all. In fact, um, I love it. I love the way that that came through. It has this kind of like cooling sensation on your palate too, which is really cool. Um, no, no pun intended. So last but certainly not least in this just sea of flavors is um, a cool like basil almost note. I think it's basil or rosemary or a cross between the two. And that's just really interesting because I used neither spice in this. And I'm not sure if that's coming from the cardamom or if it's coming from the yeast. My theory is that it's coming from the cardamom. Um, and I think it's awesome. Every single flavor in here is just a very delicate spice. Um, and it's just kind of painted on that background of soft wheat. And I, I love it. Every single bit about this beer is something that I love. Um, and I, I just... Uh, I'm really, really happy it turned out the way that it did. I think um, even though right now it's definitely getting colder um, and the, the leaves are starting to turn here in New England, um, I think it still does make a decent end of summer beer and it bridges that gap pretty well into fall. I'm able to sit out here in both hot and cooler evenings and enjoy this um, in either circumstance. So overall, this is a tremendous success. Um, I'm not going to change the um, I, I highly recommend using exactly the spices that I did for exactly the volume of beer that I have. Um, it just seems to be perfect for me. Uh, and I am looking for delicacy in this beer, so I don't think it's overdone. It's definitely noticeable. It's definitely there. It is definitely the point of this beer, but it is not overdone. And I just ended up loving this thing. <laughs> as far as like brewing tips in general go, though, um, I think there's one non-negotiable piece of this, and that is if you are making this beer 
go to the supermarket, buy a fresh orange and zest it instead of buying the dried stuff at your homebrew shop or online. There's just no comparison. I have used the dry stuff before and it's just muted and uninteresting. This fresh stuff is 100% responsible for how bright and alive this just feels and tastes. I, I don't think there's a substitute. I mean, if you've ever gone to a great Italian restaurant and had like a, a really well-made red sauce with some true, you know, fresh basil put into it, you can taste it and you know how good that is. Versus when you try to make it at home with the dried basil and it's just, it's just not great. That's kind of like the best analogy I can, I can give. Like in most cases, whether you're cooking or brewing, fresh spice is almost always better than the dried version of it. The other uh, topic of discussion that I think needs to be mentioned is um, adding spices in the boil like I did versus adding them in secondary as if you were dry hopping with them. Um, I have not tried that method, so I can't really speak to whether or not one is better than the other. Perhaps some of you have, and if you have, please comment down below and tell us what happened. Um, I, I've never done it before, but I think this method produced a really awesome beer, and I'm sure the other one does too. I think uh, the classic way to do it is to throw it in the boil, uh, but it, I think there's definitely merit for both ways. I'd just be very interested to see what the differences would be. So I've decided to stop rating my beers on a scale of 1 to 10 because uh, I think that's just really subjective and it doesn't really tell you anything. And I think um, based on my descriptions of it, it tells you everything you need to know about how good or bad it is. In this case, I really do think this is one of my best beers I've made in a long time though. Um, and I will say that much. Also, I kind of want to quickly talk about how it could be improved. Um, no beer is necessarily perfect. I do like pretty much every aspect of this beer. Um, but I think the one thing that could be improved is a bit lighter of a color. Like I said earlier, that has everything to do with just not boiling as long and maybe adding a little bit more unmalted adjuncts. And that's really it. Uh, <laughs> that's the only thing I can really find to pick this thing apart with. Uh, so. I'm very happy with the way that it turned out. Uh, so if you do choose to make the beer, there is a recipe down below in the description box, just the way that I've brewed it. Um, so hopefully that works out well for you. In the meantime, I have kind of a big announcement for the channel that I'm gonna drop right now. And that is, I am starting a Patreon. Uh, that is gonna be linked down in the uh, description box as well as on the end screen of this video if you wanna check that out. Patreon in a nutshell is going to be an additional platform uh, where I can put out even more content in addition to my YouTube channel as well as my Instagram page. So head on over there, I have an intro video there where you can see uh, just exactly what I'm trying to accomplish with that. But there are basically a series of goals there um, that will take this channel to a completely new level. And I think that Patreon is probably the best way to actually achieve that. All right, so if you like the video, please go ahead and hit the like button. Uh, it does really help the channel out quite a bit. And uh, if you like to see this stuff on the regular, hit the subscribe button. I will typically upload a brand new grain to glass video roughly every two to three weeks. I do the best I can to maintain that schedule depending on how fast I can brew um, and what kind of space I have uh, within my case. If you want more frequent updates about what's going on, please check out the Patreon, but also check out my Instagram page. That is at the apartment brewer on Instagram. And there I typically post an update about what's going on roughly every two to three days depending on uh, you know what's going on in my life so there you'll be able to see what types of brews are going to be making their way to the YouTube channel within you know, a couple weeks or so um, you can stay on top of what's happening in real time if there's any aspect of this beer you want to discuss uh, the, or the brewing process please drop a comment down below I love reading all the comments I do read every single one and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can last but certainly not least down in the description box down below there is a complete list of all of my home brewing equipment and links to Amazon or other retailers where you could purchase it for yourself if you wish to and if you happen to be in the market for some of that equipment and you do choose to buy something through one of those links I do earn a very small commission but it is at no additional cost to you and and it does go right back into supporting this channel, so I do appreciate it. So anyway, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and finish off the rest of this ridiculously drinkable beer. And I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.